He's got cut. Running down the half guard. He reels it in at the 15. Cooper yeah. Cup has the catch. Has yeah. The greatest deep tackle ever right here. It's good. Mike Williams with the grab. Feeling fresh as hell. You're listening to the L.A. Football Podcast. Hey, what's going on, Los Angeles? Welcome to the L.A. Football Show here on the L.A. Football Network. Live on the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio, always on LAFBnetwork.com. Make sure to check out all of our YouTubes. Uh, We have one for each team, Chargers, Rams, Trojans, Bruins, uh, just search the name plus LAFB. You'll find us, and we are everywhere you get your podcast. I uh, got a fun show for you today. Uh, we'll get into it in a minute. But as always, joined by the great madman, Jamal Manny. What's up, brother? How we doing? How was the 4th of July? Doing well, Rye. Great to see you. Uh, always a, a fun 4th of July. You know, had an opportunity to spend some time with with some friends after a while and just uh, relaxed. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting week. Given that Fourth of July is on Tuesday, it just feels like everyone took Monday off, and even kind of the slow roll back into the week. This is feels like a great week to take some vacation, and even if you are working, this seems like a really nice downtime. Where even if you're not taking vacation, there's kind of a pseudo chill vibe in the office um, this particular week. So hopefully, everyone's getting an opportunity to rest and recharge, not just for the fourth but also for this week as we are in the heart of summer and uh, really excited about that. Yeah. See, I was smart. I'm taking, I'm going on vacation next week. Perfect. Uh, So you really get two weeks off of vacation. I mean, that's, that's the way to play it. You know, it reminds me growing up. uh, I remember my spring break in high school. I had a buddy that was in a different district. So we had a different spring break the week after, Um, but we got a little, our friends had a little cabin up in the mountains um and so in spring in colorado in the mountains you still there's a lot of snow it's not like spring um so we go up there and so he's like oh, i'll just take the week off of school uh it's no big deal uh, well it ends up being that his entire week we get tons of snow down in denver so his whole week gets canceled with snow days and then he also gets the next week for spring break i was so jealous as a kid so i did that approach with my uh my work schedule this week so it should be love fun. that um, where'd you spend 4th of July? Were you in, uh, in Westwood or what city were you in? I was, I was in Westwood. We were at home and, you know, just had uh, a little bit of a, a get together with, with some friends and yeah, just super chill. Is it, is it pretty mellow there with fireworks or do, do people go crazy? There? No, I mean, it's, it, there's sort of different pockets. So like Rancho park has amazing fireworks. So you can actually kind of go to the park and, you know, kind of have a picnic and, and, uh, you know, kind of check out the fireworks there. There's some things that are going on um, even down in Santa Monica, obviously. So West L.A. is a little bit more pocketed. I will say I was kind of jealous of my friends up in the Bay Area uh, who were kind of based in the city. Those folks were just sort of crushing it in terms of fireworks. Some of them kind of live on the hill. And just to see kind of that fireworks show was really incredible. Uh, You know, in, in L.A., though, what I will say is in West L.A., the fireworks lasted probably you know, the better part of the night. I mean, I, you know, we were here in fireworks up until midnight, uh, you know, and they started around seven o'clock. So it, it was quite a busy and eventful uh, evening. I missed most of that. My entire, I don't know what happened. My entire thing shut off. Um, <laughs> I was I just talking you... fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but long story short, you said it's, it's mellow in Westwood. Not any, no, like... I mean, it's, it's, you know, there, there's actually a lot going on. There's actually a lot going on. Okay. Cause we went to, um, west covina to my sister-in-law's place and it was like a war zone out there it was pretty cool yeah you know there were some people doing fireworks shows that it seemed like it was like the city put it on because it was so impressive the amount of uh fireworks they had and probably the money they spent and um and then we went the night before on the third we went to duarte had like a, a city get together they did a fireworks show and um unfortunately that night we forgot mia's little like earphones so she was just freaking out the whole time so i didn't even get a watch oh, no. I, was, like, I was like under a blanket with her just like trying to console her as you can just hear like stuff going off in the background but it, it sounded like it was a cool fireworks show but i didn't get to see it so that's awesome I gotta, yeah i gotta see someone the fourth at least in, in west covina so and then i got back to pasadena and in previous years so we used to live south of the 210 
real quiet down there. Basically, you have the Rose Bowl show. Now I live north of the 210, and you definitely get a lot more neighborhood fireworks up this way. So it's pretty loud all night. So I, I, I can relate to what you said. For sure, for sure. No, it's a, it's always a fun and festive atmosphere. You know, the fireworks, 4th of July, there's a vibe. And then there's kind of New Year's fireworks, there's a vibe. I remember one year, me and my wife were actually in Iceland for New Year's. And I will tell you, I, Reykjavik, Iceland, maybe mm. has the greatest fireworks of any city in the world. I know everyone talks a lot about New York and Dubai and Singapore and Shanghai. I'll tell you, go into Reykjavik because folks can just, you know, that you kind of collect in the town square and then folks had at it. They all had their own fireworks and that went nonstop till about four or five in the morning. And it was just, I mean, it was some pretty epic sequences there. That was, that was quite the experience. I'll never forget that. Wow. I love Reykjavik. I mean, they only work like 10 days a year or 10 days a month. So they got plenty of time to store up all the heck. All yeah. The yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Iceland, if you haven't been, Iceland's like the coolest country I've ever been to. Not that I've been to a ton of countries, but Iceland was super cool. So, yeah. Um, well, that show is always brought to you by our friends at BetOnline. Head to BetOnline.ag today. Use our promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-E-A-V. Gets you a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Did you bet on Joey Chestnut? Hot dog eating contest? That's a, uh, I mean, Joey Chestnut at this point, you know, the last seven or eight years after kind of Kobayashi, right? It was Chestnut and Kobayashi yeah. was the great rivalry. And then Kobayashi retired. I mean, Chestnut in the hot dog eating contest on 4th of July, what is that? Plus 27,000. I mean, at yeah. this point, you know, it's uh, that the day Chestnut loses will be maybe the greatest upset in the history of North American sports. I hope he. I hope he just walks away before he loses. Yeah. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Ride, let's give it a rest. But yeah, it's not even worth betting. You, you'd have to bet like ten thousand dollars to make like a hundred bucks. Yeah, <laughs> I ridiculous. mean it's it's ridiculous. Um, but you can do that all bet online. Obviously, that event has passed, but plenty still going on. Um, we got MLS kicking off, or it has been kicked off. We got MLB, and obviously football right around the corner. So bet online today. G promo code believe. Tell them the guys at the LA Football Network sent you. Today, we are going to embark on a journey comparing our L.A. football players. We've kind of done this the last few episodes with the offseason going on, but Jamal just finished, in my opinion, one of the greatest shows ever written in Ted Lasso on Apple+. Plus. And so we're going to look at, instead of just going a team basis, we're going to go all of L.A. football, current players and coaches and staff, and who would play main 11 characters i'll read them here in just a minute so we'll have a lot of fun doing that but jamal gotta ask you first thoughts on the on the series overall thoughts on the finale because we haven't been able to talk about it much since you were catching up to finish but now that you're done we can finally kind of spill some tea about it oh absolutely right i mean obviously just what a what a tremendous feel good show and i think it just came at such a the right time in the world you know with the pandemic and you know, folks needing to to feel better about themselves, society, their communities, and and you know all of that, and just it was just the perfect, um, you know, ingredient, and just is the perfect medicine for all of that at this particular point in time, and just you know made you kind of reaffirm your faith in people and in goodness, and it just was such a terrific show. I'm so happy they ended it at after three seasons, and you know, sort of you know, had that perfect kind of beginning, middle and end story arc over the course where it didn't lag in any way, shape or form. Uh, So in that regard, I just thought it was just such a marvelous show. I will say, having said all of that, Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 finale flatlined a little bit for me. You know, it it, I think there was really an opportunity to to end the show um, in, in a very significantly epic way. I think there was really opportunities for the writers to you know, sort of dig deeper. And I think they played it way too safe. Uh, You know, the, the, they, the writers almost felt like a team that was up 14 or 17 points in the fourth quarter. And they were, they were playing not to lose rather than play to win, you know? And so to me, you you can't really screw up the finale because I think the, the writing was on the wall from the beginning of the third season that Ted was going to go back to the States to be with his son. So there was an inevitable finality there. The moment they said, this is the last season of the show. You knew that's how it was going to end. So you can't really screw that up. But just in the way, I think there were some opportunities, you know, the final conversation with Ted and Nate, the final conversation with Ted and Rebecca, 
the the final conversation with Roy and and Jamie and you know just there were all of these dynamics where I think you know it was either just I'm sorry or thank you and I I just thought they played it way too safe and um, mm-hmm. so I, I it flatlined a little bit for me that that finale especially when you compare it to say the finale of a show like Succession that you know that was sort of a you know next level of of just writing genius there but uh, incredible show. I wish the finale, you know, will go would have gone down more in television history. I think it's going to be kind of a forgettable finale in that regard. Yeah, I think a lot of people are on the same page as you. I, I saw it when it was over, like that was kind of what most people were saying. I personally, I loved it. Um, I thought the show in general did a very good job of staying real. And it didn't go over the top throughout all three seasons. And it was kind of like a it hit home because it was very relatable, even though this they're living in, you know, these are multimillionaires playing soccer and it's over in England, a different state. But it was still very like relatable. And I thought the ending, in my opinion, was relatable in the sense that usually when stuff ends in real life, it's kind of non monumental. It's like, a, oh, a goodbye here, a thank you here, a, a much love here. And, um, you know, there's obviously those those moments of opportunity to do that. Uh, but I just thought it was more realistic, I guess. And. But I agree. It would have been I would have definitely not been opposed to had they taken some more risks on it. But for me, I was like, oh, I kind of like the way it ended. I thought it was just. Felt yeah, very- no, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it, it speaks to kind of, you know, how, how things end in real life. I, I do think that the ending was actually quite unrealistic because I think that, you know, Ted being the central figure of really creating this world and everybody else stays in that world. But him, you know, I think that the truly realistic outcome would have been his son coming to England, you know, and, and, and sort of being able to, to be a dad, but also be the coach. I think if you really think about life in a very practical way, in a very real way, that's probably the way it ends, you know, Mm -hmm. rather than him kind of leaving this whole world behind that everyone's still there. I mean, even, even beard is still there. Beard wants to stay. So he goes and leaves that world to be with the son, which is incredible, but coaches his son playing soccer while, you know, they're all playing soccer over here, he could have just as easily done that, um, you know, staying in, in, in Europe. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I, I, I just thought that the, the last conversations were just too safe. You know, the, the, the whole buildup uh, about this whole interaction between Ted and Nate, it just felt like the whole third season was a buildup to that final conversation. And there really wasn't a conversation. And when you talk about what Ted and Rebecca meant to each other, over the course of the show. I mean, there was even some sexual tension there between the two of them. And so for it to sort of end so flat um, in terms of their last interaction, same thing with Jamie and Roy, uh, you know, it was actually Beard and Nate probably had the the, the greatest conversation um, between the two. And I think introducing Ted's mom so late in the show and I think took away from, you know, the groundwork of the characters that were there from day one. So... You know, that's sort of the film critic in me coming out a little bit. Incredible show, I, but it left me wanting more. Yeah, well, I, I wish it would have had one more season. I know you said three was perfect, but I feel like the, they had to pack so much into that third yeah. season, um, which they did a good job of doing. But yeah, you could definitely sometimes it felt like, what was it, 12 episodes? Like one through six was still very much like the previous two seasons where it was like, not slow moving in a bad way, but like a lot was happening. And in the last six, it was just like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Yeah. Like hit all these like arcing points, but well, it's my favorite at at this moment. It's my favorite show of all time in terms of just, I think when I started watching it, when it came out, the characters, how you get to know them. Um, So absolutely loved it. Glad you were able to get all caught up and, and um, uh, up to date on it. And you know, there's, there's rumors out there that there may be a little spinoff. You never know. So maybe not with, Sudeikis and Lasso, but maybe uh, maybe he left that world because another that world's going to continue on with the outlying of cast. We never know. Yeah, we'll that'll be interesting. I, I mean, I I can't recall in the history of television a spinoff ever working. So yeah, uh, you know, uh, at the same time, we're sort of living in a world in Hollywood where originality has has gone to die, and you know, right now it's all about ROI. And if there's a brand that works, a franchise that works. In terms of ROI, you know, the, the spreadsheet will say, go do a spinoff, even when creatively your creative instincts know that it's not going to work. So I hope there's no spinoff, but, um, you know, there probably will be given given where entertainment is today. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if there has been a sitcom. I can think of like 
action and fantasy like House of Dragon, I think, had some success after Game of Thrones and and stuff of that regard. But yeah, I can't think of like a sitcom that's had like a spinoff. I think the only the only successful sp- spinoff sitcom, and you can argue whether it was a spinoff or not, was Frasier. You know, because yeah. Frasier was a spinoff of Cheers, and Frasier was yeah. an incredible show, iconic show. Kelsey Grammer was so phenomenal, but how much of his character? stayed his character in Cheers like it was there for maybe the first half season and then it became kind of its own show so I think a tr- you know you could sort of argue now the purist will say well was that truly a spinoff um, you know and that's certainly open for debate but outside of that I can't really think of a spinoff that that actually worked yeah I can't even I can't think of many that are even like real have happened so if you can let us know hit us up on twitter at ryan diet lafb at lafb jams or text us lafb to 31032 um but yeah so let's jump into this so we got 11 characters we're going to be diving through the next 40 or so minutes obviously ted lasso beard roy kent jamie tart nate the great rebecca keely trent crim the independent sam obasenya danny rojas and the dreaded Rupert. So should be fun. I kind of got Keely in there too, right? Yeah. Said Keely in there after yeah. Rebecca. So, cool, cool. um, well, yeah, let's just, uh, let's jump into this. Is there someone dealer's choice, right? You get, you can kick off whoever, whoever character you want to start with. Let's start. Let's go feel good vibes right off the bat. Let's start with our good friend, Danny Rojas. Uh, what a, tremendous character i don't think he was introduced till the either late first season or even second season i'm trying to remember back now um yeah i'll just let you start and we can talk more about it danny rojas who which la football player would play danny rojas you know what you know what's interesting about rojas's character is you know obviously just like very charismatic nice guy the long flowing hair and just the nicest guy in the world but then you know when he represented his country in mexico he became this totally different alter ego with the passion for, you know, his nation and just, you know, then everything became, you know, good versus evil. And, and, you know, everybody else was the enemy and, you know, just sort of a spectacular player on the field as well. And when I think of those elements in LA football, I think of Cooper cup, because I think that Cooper cup is one of those guys was this incredibly nice guy, the long flowing hair, but I think Cooper cup, you know, identifies with LA the way Danny Rojas identifies with Mexico. You know, I, I go back to the the parade with Cooper Cup and, you know, channeling Kobe and just all the things that he wore about LA. And it just very much feels like Cooper Cup embodies the city of LA more than I think any other professional football player across the Rams or the Chargers does. And so he's this incredibly nice, engaging guy. But when you get him on the field and LA is threatened in some way, he becomes this total alter ego. And obviously Danny Rojas was a beast on the field. Cooper Cup is a beast on the field. You know, they're kind of built similarly as well. And so for me, Danny Rojas is, is Cooper Cup. Love that. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And Cooper Cup obviously embodies that love for the game. And you hear him in interviews talk about it. And so I think that's fits. Mine, uh, for similar reasons, um, but I went with who I believe, and obviously I think there's a lot more than just one person, but who I believe is probably the most football purist out of all four of our LA teams. And I went with Sean McVay, coach. Uh, Not only a football purist, like football, maybe up until this past couple months or year that he's gotten married and now is pregnant, but football was life for Sean McVay, you know, grew up in a football family, began interning and coaching at a very young age under John Gruden in Tampa Bay was the youngest head coach ever hired as a head coach still to this day is like the youngest head coach in the NFL. And so football not only was his life. So I think that comparison, Danny Rojas obviously says all the time football is life. Um, but also in the arc of the character and the arc of what we see McVay, McVay, McVay comes into LA is the wonder kid. So, I mean, obviously there's a, maybe that's where someone goes uh, with Nate, the great character, but he is the wonder kid uh, in terms of football knowledge and offensive and what he was able to turn around with the Rams from Jeff Fisher to just in two years, go to the Super Bowl. Danny Rojas comes into the team and it's just this, you know, this unbelievable talent that they needed to get to the next level. Rojas then in the, in the second season hits the, hits the mascot and kills the dog and kind of goes into a dark place and just can't, 
quite get out of it. He has the yips. John McVay last year, we saw all the injuries. No one died, thank God. Yeah. But all the injuries, he kind of goes into this dark place. And he even said afterwards it was a dark season. Didn't know if he wanted to continue coaching. Fell out of love of the game. And then now, obviously, this is speculation because we're going into a new year, but it seems like McVay is out of that fog, getting back to what he's used to, having fun building his staff. They're going to have 33 rookies on the team, so a ton of youth around him. And Rojas kind of found that again later on throughout the series of being that just joy to be around in football, and and it was everything that he wanted to do. And so Sean McVay is Danny Rojas for me. Oh, I love that. Oh, man. I, and, and I think the character arc is so spot on, Ryan. You know, what's interesting is – and and I you know the the way you illustrated the story is so perfect. I think with Rojas, the the getting out of the dark place into the light required a lot of trust with yeah. his teammates. Required a lot of trust with Ted, you know, and just you could tell that there were moments there where you know you had to sort of put your arm around him and sort of lean in. And I think I wonder if Sean McVay has done that, you know, and and I think that there's sort of this interesting narrative with McVay where he almost pretends like nothing bothers him and he's always just there for other people and never really there for himself and then you always get the last couple seasons you've gotten these reports in the offseason where he's so close to quitting he's so at the edge and I worry sometimes about McVay that he doesn't take enough time to be honest with himself like Mm -hmm. you hear these stories of you know he's he he's so close to quitting and then 48 hours later he's like I'm ready to coach next year and it's like really like you 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 made that determination in 48 hours like don't you want to take a couple of weeks don't you really want to kind of get deeper and figure out do you really want to do this and so i i love the parallels with Rojas and and it's, it fits so well with McVeigh i worry a little bit about McVeigh if he hasn't done the work that Rojas did in the show and with those mm-hmm. around him to get out of that place and whether he's just it's just a scotch tape and glue situation and he's still sort of avoiding the real issues uh, that are going on in terms of what he wants in his life. I, I hope he gets there. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that a lot, Jamal, back when it was still unknown if he's going to retire. Is like if he doesn't, like he needs to have full clarity and full commitment or yeah. it's just going to keep cropping up after every loss or after yeah. every tough time, like you have to have full clarity that this is. And, what and, you and Brian, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if he's there yet. You know, I, I think, I don't know if I'm convinced that, you know, he's saying all the right things. It's sort of easy to say all the right things in June and July and, and sort of be refreshed again, but I don't know if he's done the work. And, and I, I, I don't know if there's anything that's really happened where if the Rams go in a funk this season, lose three in a row, those conversations don't come back. And so I think that's going to be a fascinating storyline this year with the Rams. And obviously you and I are going to be all over it. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, moving down the list, let's go, let's go Sam Obasenya. One of my favorite care. I mean, they're all great, but he's one of my favorite characters, just the, the charm. He opens his own restaurant, which has always been kind of a dream of mine behind the scenes. So who you got for, for good old Sam? Yeah, you know, when you think about Sam Obisania, you think about the guy that kind of has it all, right? I mean, he's got the looks, he's got the charisma, you know, there's all of these, I mean, even Rebecca and and him have their soiree and, you know, all these sort of girls all think he's very handsome, he's polite, he's engaging, he's an absolute beast on the field. I mean, he's basically the the next in in line to be the captain. He kind of comes, you see sort of the raw talent. And then in, in early in season one, it needs to be harnessed. And then he's this star that not only everybody from AFC Richmond wants and needs, but, you know, his home country wants him. And he's just he's this sort of mega icon in many ways, but but still maintaining a sense of humility. And to me, when you look at L.A. football, I mean, it's Caleb Williams, right? I mean, when you when you look at the guy who's kind of got it all in terms of talent, in terms of looks, in terms of charisma, in terms of endorsements, it's Caleb Williams. And also... When you see the high school tape of Caleb, when you saw the flashes at Oklahoma, you know, and he came to USC with Lincoln Riley, you said, hey, there's something here for sure. But is he going to kind of take that next step and be the face of college football? Remember, Kirk Herbstreet 18 months ago said Caleb Williams is going to be the next face of college football. And Sam Obisania in many ways was the face of of AFC Richmond and, and the, you know, their play on the field in so many different ways. So. For me, the parallels between Caleb and Sam uh, were, were pretty spot on. And so, uh, you know, I, I saw a lot of a CW13 in, in Mr. Obisenio. 
Yeah, I mean that's great. The charisma, absolutely, and the the talent and and on the field play certainly matches that, and and kind of the future arc they leave you with of what Sam's going to go on to do, and obviously we know what Caleb has the ability to go on and do. Um, again, I went very similar, just different player, but I had same exact kind of conversation and why, and I went with Justin Herbert um, for basically everything you just said. Like it's kind of like you know Sam's a little more soft spoken, kind of like. Uh, leads by example, just a very genuine human being. Herbert certainly puts that that face on with the media, with with the community. He's just much more soft-spoken, kind of keeps himself, but does the right things, says the right things. Um, he's passionate about football, but he's not like, you know, he, he's, I, I think, cares about other things just as much, if not more. I mean, we know about his his love for fishing and other things like that. And Sam has the love for the restaurant and food and cuisine and, and some political issues that he has a – Up, the leadership matches up, but also the the quieter dexterior that they both kind of lead with as the kind of pseudo captains, but not maybe the vocal captains uh, that you know many people view captainship as. So that's the comparison I saw. I love it. Yeah, no, and I think I think the the, the soft spoken element, Ryan, I think is is really where I I see that synergy really well. So I, I love that. Yeah. So, all right, let's go. Let's go, Rebecca. Rebecca is always, uh, uh, you know, these are always interesting comparisons uh, when you when you compare a player with a, a female lead. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what we can do here. And, you know, obviously is such a great character. And uh, she as an actress is just like amazing and what she was able to do and um, kind of her long climb to now this fame that she's reached. So who's playing Rebecca, Jamal? So to me, Ryan, Rebecca is Lincoln Riley. And the, the reason I say that is, you know, Rebecca, th- there's a couple of elements in, in terms of the character. The, the first is, you know, where is the motivation at the beginning for, for Rebecca? And, and it's to sort of, you know, obviously beat her ex-husband. And, and you could tell that in, in big games leading into that final season and the final episode, really the final two episodes, Rebecca was always someone who, you know, so charismatic, everyone, you know, sort of gravitated towards her really, you know, a a tremendous leader. You could see that right away, had an edge to her as well, but also very personable. But you could tell in the big games, Rebecca got really tight and, you know, where she was wanting to win the games, you know, by sort of by any means necessary and just kind of get it done and let's get this thing over with. And I just got to win for these external reasons. And for as great as Lincoln Riley has been over the first six years of his career, the knock on Lincoln Riley has been in mm-hmm. the big games, he kind of chokes. And, yep. you know, and, and he blows kind of big leads in those games as well from time to time. And so, you know, that a- element of growth, I think, for Riley, that last step of, of being able to sort of be his best in the big games, I think is where I'm really excited to see Lincoln Riley and USC go. But I think there's a real parallel there of where Lincoln Riley is today and where Rebecca was for most of the show up until she found the internal motivation and and was sort of able to overcome that. And I'm excited about that journey with Lincoln Riley. I think the second piece for me, Ryan, with Rebecca is this notion of home. You know, she has the 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 final conversation with Ted and says, look, it's really important for you to go home to be with your son. And it's really important for me now to understand that this is my home and stay with my home and with my family. And I think that's going to be the next sort of conversation around, around Lincoln Riley, right? I mean, is he just the hired gun that SC brought out the checkbook for? And when that Cowboys job opens up or when that preeminent NFL job opens up, does he leave to go there, to be with McVeigh and to be with LaFleur and to be with sort of his peers? Or does he treat USC as home? And is this a place where he can sort of anchor for the next 8, 10, 12 years and really build a legacy and a family and a community and, you know, a, a sense of history? And so to me, that is also the other fascinating dimension with Lincoln Riley is, you know, his ability to sort of manage his nerves in, in, in the big moments and then how he sort of thinks about home and his place moving forward and just the, the clarity that will come with that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's perfect. That's spot on. I think the the big game comparison is is very 
um, interesting and, and very true. And then obviously the, the home comparison and, and we've talked a lot about, is this a, a three to four year thing, or is it truly a 10 year thing that they sign him for and beyond? And, you know, he, again, as most coaches do says all the right things, talks about how highly he is and with USC and even with obviously the Mike Bones scandal and all that, like he stayed grounded in saying, Hey, we're here building something and, and we're going to move forward. And, and so we will see as this season progresses as the move to the big 10 happens, you know, kind of some comparison there with Rebecca, you know, they get relegated and then they move back exactly. up into the premier league into the premier league. And this is a USC going into the big 10, which many kind of view as the premier league, them and sec in college football. So um, there's that comparison as well. So yeah, I think Lincoln Riley is a, a great one um, for me. I went, I went a very, not very different, but somewhat different route there. And I'll try to explain this, right. Cause there's no, there's no divorce or, you know, there's not the Rebecca Rupert dynamic, but I think there's still the somewhat comparison of, of either one upping or proving yourself. And so I'm going to go with Rams owner, Stan Kroenke and Stan was a very successful real estate developer. Um, so he, you know, earned his money on his own. And then after he was either before or after, but during the time of buying the Rams in St. Louis married into the Walton family and, you know, as successful, and this is all just me talking off the cuff. I obviously don't know these. These are not factual things. But as successful as he was, you marry into arguably top five most successful families in American history. And you're at Thanksgiving dinner sitting across your brother-in-law, your father-in-law. And, oh, by the way, your wife is more wealthy than you, has made more money than you. There may be that little chip to like, okay, love you. You're my wife. Again, not the divorce factor, but I still do want to prove myself in terms of success. I've just bought this NFL franchise. I also own teams in the NBA and the NHL out in Denver. And so I want to prove that I can, I didn't just marry into this family for what you have, but I'm bringing even more to the table than just some, some real estate background. So that's kind of the comparisons I saw was just that chip to be better than uh, their better half, worse half, whatever you want to call it. And so Stan Kroenke, obviously, uh, not saying anything, taking anything away from his wife, but Stan Kroenke obviously has proven uh, in the last you know decade uh, that he has been very successful, not only in real estate, but in the sports world now with the Avalanche, the Nuggets, and obviously the Rams all winning championships in, in less than two years apart. So um, that was kind of a, a comparison. That I, I love that. And I think I think the Rebecca Rupert dynamic is so fitting with, with uh, Kroenke. And you and I have talked about this. I mean, Kroenke is a, you know, a billionaire and, and one of the wealthiest owners in all the professional sports, but he, he married into the Walton family. I mean, you know, you talk about top five. I mean, by sheer wealth, the father, Sam Walton, would still be considered the richest person in the world today, um, just given the, the, the vastness of that empire. So there's always going to be that dynamic of I am very successful on my own. I, I am my own brand, but I'm part of this sort of larger family sort of dynasty where I got to show, you know, that I'm, I'm capable as well. So I, I think that dynamic is spot on. Love it. So, all right, let's do, want to do beard next? Sure. Beard's care. I love beard's character. And obviously he was one of the creators of the show. Um, uh, I did some reading, but I'm pretty sure he had the concept and then went to Jason Sudeikis after he had kind of developed uh, what he wanted to do. And then obviously he's one of the main characters, but um, who you got playing the great beard. You know what I love about beard is, you know, he's the loyal assistant coach to Ted, you know, and, and so much comes out about his character at the end of, you know, Ted giving him a second chance at, at not just a job, but at a life. And I think where we learned the most about beard was the middle of the second season, if you recall, that night that he kind of goes yep. out partying, right? And, you know, you see all these different aspects of his personality and, you know, his the dynamic with his girlfriend and, you know, the fact that he loves music and he loves, you know, late nights and, you know, doing all kinds of different things in terms of substances. And he, he's just a very interesting guy, way more mm -hmm. interesting and multidimensional in terms of his interests and his loves about music and, and other things than really, um, you know, any other character per se. And whenever you even see him at the desk of the office, he's always reading a very unique book and whatnot. And so to me, when I think about the, the context of L.A. football, I think of Ken Norton Jr. And when you look at, you know, that great assistant coach mm. that's by the side of the head coach, 
but who's lived all of these different lives and been so interesting along the way. I mean, Kenny Norton Jr. is still the only player in NFL history to win three consecutive Super Bowls. You know, the, the two with the Cowboys, the one with the Niners. Then he finishes a decorated career in the pros. He's Pete Carroll's assistant for arguably the greatest dynasty in college football the last 25, 30 years and is front row to the, the liner at Reggie Bush years. Then he goes with Pete to Seattle for, you know, the, 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 the great teams, the Legion of Boom teams and part of that epic you know, game with uh, obviously, you know, the Broncos the first year, then the Patriots the second year where Marshawn doesn't get the ball. I mean, think about the two games that, you know, Ken Norton Jr. has sort of lost as an assistant coach. I mean, the Vince Young Rose Bowl and the Marshawn Lynch Super Bowl. I mean, you know, probably the two most iconic endings, college and pro respectively. And now he's back at UCLA, back home you know, to sort of rebuild that that franchise. And Beard has the opportunity at the end to sort of keep going with Ted or kind of come back to where he believes his home is and he chooses home. And so both these guys, assistant coaches, both have lived these extraordinary lives in this very unique way and, and both find themselves back and, and being content with being the assistant coaches at home. So for me, Beard is Kenny Norton Jr. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and I, I think I'll, I'm curious if a lot of players would agree with you because they kind of have that. He has that same vibe a little bit. And maybe his yeah, coaching yeah. style is, is similar to Beard. So um, I w- I'm glad you referenced that episode in, in season two because that's kind of a, basically what I sold my entire comparison on. It might not be very accurate, but um, you know, I, I feel like Beard's, Beard's character, like you said, is is kind of it's nuanced, but it's also very just kind of quiet. He has a job to do, right? Like he's there to support Ted and he's the X's and O guys that actually understands soccer. <laughs> like if Ted's the raw, raw emotional relationship guy, he's the guy that's actually going to teach like what's happening uh, and how you get to po- from point A to point B. And then you see in that episode that you alluded to kind of let his hair down a little bit. And we see the other side of beard as the human being. And so I went with Aaron Donald and Aaron Donald, a guy that, for his whole career is very kind of buttoned up. He's football only. He's the, the greatest defensive player on earth, his entire career, basically, um, you know, stays out of trouble. And then there was that after they won the Super Bowl, all of a sudden we saw the, the human Aaron Donald, the shirt off at the parade. We saw him courtside drunk at the Laker game. He was on one of the, I can't remember which one, but one on the late night shows. I can't remember if it was James Corden show or one of those, but couldn't even really talk. He was slurring his words because he had just been partying all, all day and all night as rightfully so after winning the Super Bowl. So a loose comparison, but basically two guys that have a job to do, take their job very seriously, do their job very, very well. But then we saw another side of them in a, in a short instance, and they got back to doing things by the book right after. Um, but that, that's kind of where I got the the beard and AD. Beard and AD. I love that. I love that beard and AD. You know, it's so interesting that, you know, for me, I don't know if their characters line up, you know, quite, quite that way. But if you took one night of Beard and one night of Aaron Donald, those are mirror images of each other, to your point. Yeah. I mean, that that episode in season two of Beard just partying it up. And then you look at Aaron Donald the night after the Rams win the Super Bowl. I think it's the same night. I mean, you know, that those are mirror images of each other. And so I, I love that comparison. And I think that's the beauty of you know, comparing sports and entertainment because the comparison could last years and decades. The comparison could last one night or a few hours and it all just comes down to lens and perspective. And so love that, right? You know, those two nights, man, oh man, those were, those were both benders. Yeah. Basically uh, an entire night made or entire comparison made just on on one (laughs) evening, but we'll take it. All right, let's go. uh, I want to save the big four. I've, I've struggled with these. Next two, okay. Well, let's let's start with let's do Keely next. Keely, what a fun character at the show. Uh, the actress absolutely kills it, and and kind of she stays the same through all three seasons, but also has very like big ebbs and flows. But it's not like her character changes. I think sometimes we what what happens in television is you see a character like totally shift who they are. Obviously, sometimes that's on purpose, like we saw with Nate. Um, but hers is very like the same. But obviously, just her career path and stuff kind of changed. So, who you got with Keely? So for this one, Ryan, Keeley to me is Sean McVay. And the, the, the reason I say that is, you know, Keeley is this person who over the course of the show that, that everyone either sort of wants to be with or, you know, wants to sort of be associated with. When you think about Keeley, obviously Jamie and Roy are sort of fighting for her love. Even Nate, tried, you know, kissed her, you know, mm-hmm. in, in earlier in the show. 
Rebecca obviously wants to be her friend. Ted wants to be her friend. You know, e- even the other assistant coaches, all, they all want to sort of be around her. She's someone who I think is looked at as a star and 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 sort of a celebrity and, and someone who, you know, really holds a lot of gravitas. And to all of your earlier points, that's that was Sean McVay, given his resume. And I think over the course of the show, it's really all about how Keely is trying to balance her life. And, you know, she's with the team. And then, you know, the, the second season is all about her career and kind of going off on her own with her own PR firm and navigating and dealing with those challenges, but then also dealing and navigating with the challenges of love and having, you know, her personal life, her professional life, you know, in, in harmonious synchronicity in a way where she can still be who she is, but also sort of bring these dimensions along the way. And I think that's to our earlier point, Ryan. I mean, that's the journey that Sean McVay is on. John McVay is someone who everyone, you know, sort of aspires to be in, in the coaching community. And when you think about NFL intellect and and just football acumen and all of these things. And I think to your point, he's still kind of the same guy where he's like, you know, I love football, but now I'm married. Now I'm going to have a kid. Now, I, you know, I'm a, a little bit older. I've seen, you know, what's happened to, you know, family, you know, the John Gruden's and other members of my family who have burnt out. And so. How can I sort of stay the same, but balance my life and kind of go on this journey and find the harmony that works for me? And so I think Keeley's journey is very similar to McVeigh's journey that he's on right now. And it'll be really interesting to see how it all plays out for Sean, hopefully in a a really positive way. I'm sure it will be. But I think that's where I really see the parallels. Yeah, great. And, you know, both beautiful blonde hair and and absolutely and Both vibrant very good looking and, absolutely yeah so i like it i like it um so for me when i see keely i see someone that and it, it, again kind of ebbs and flows but in the beginning she's her own woman but she's kind of right in the shadows of of who she's with you know she mm-hmm. starts out with with, with jamie, jamie. Tart, and she's kind of like oh she's Jamie Tart's girlfriend. Like she does her own thing, but Jamie Tart's girlfriend. Then she meets Rebecca. They become best friends. She's working with Rebecca and the team. She's doing her own thing. The team love her, but she's still kind of in the shadow Mm. of Rebecca ownership, AFC Richmond, so on down the line. Well, then she branches out on her own and does her own thing. And so for me, I see USC receiver Brendan Rice. Oh, up until probably. That and I'm gonna, it's a stretch, but we'll see if we can get there. Up until that two lane game, maybe even uh, the Notre Dame game, Brandon Rice has always, and he probably always will be, but has always been in the shadow of his father, Jerry Rice. Obviously, when you when you when you're the son of the greatest receiver of all time, it's gonna be a tough shadow to get out of. But he was always seen as like, okay, here's a kid that has talent. He's from his father. He transferred from Colorado, but he hasn't made a name for himself yet this is his dad's name he's on the field because of his dad let's see if he gets there well then he has those those two games and he branches out and finally kind of breaks through that scene of like no i'm brendan rice not jerry rice i'm my own person my own player i'm gonna play with my own style and pizzazz and and gravitas and so this will be the year where it will be like keely's own pr firm that she starts this is brendan rice's year to prove that he is his own player his own receiver We've talked a lot about who's going to be the star receiver on this team, Jamal. Is it going to be Dorian Singer who transferred in? Is it going to be Mario Williams who transferred in? It could be Brendan Rice. The way he ended last season, Brendan Rice could be the star on this team. And so this is his Keeley moment to seize the moment, do his own thing, and take the lead on this receiver room. So very stretched, if you will, but that's the the comparison. Oh, I love that. No, I, I think that's that's so well said, Ryan, in terms of you know stepping out of the shadow and – I think that's certainly an element of, of Keeley's character that, that she's shep, stepped out of that shadow. And I think Brennan Rice has always been Jerry Rice's son. And I would argue up until the Tulane game. I mean, I think, you know, and up until the Tulane game, A, Brennan Rice was Jerry Rice's son. And B, Brennan Rice didn't have a very good season up until <laughs> that Tulane game. So, you know, it wasn't helping either, uh, you yeah. know, in terms of him being able to break out of that shadow. And then just the way he performed in that game and just – you know, that first half in particular and just, you know, the whole game and, and the way he went up for the ball and the, his catch radius, his sort of command of the defense and just, you know, bodying up corners and then the speed. I mean, he just sort of owned the field in a way that you just hadn't seen before. And so, you know, can he step into his own this season in a very significant way? I mean, Ryan, what's, what's so interesting is, 
you know, when you talk about stepping out of the shadow, let's not forget that USC Stanford game, you know, the, the first kind of televised game of the year last year, who was on the sideline? It was Ronnie Lott and Jerry Rice. I yeah. mean, Jerry Rice was, Jerry Rice got more airtime in the USC Stanford game than Brendan Rice did, yeah. you know? So, and Emmett point, Smith on the other side. <laughs> and Emmett Smith on the other side. I mean, my God, that was just yeah. a decorated sideline. My like, jeez. Yeah. But, oh, really. you know, that was, you know, such a symbolic moment there to your point of, you know, can he now step out of the shadow? So I, I love that element. I mean, Rai, you are really finding the corners of the room here in terms of dimensions. I mean, my God, you know, this is just really bringing the noise, Mr. Dairo. I got to write. Maybe my dream, Jamal, is to write a screenplay. Like that's one of my oh, dreams. Oh man, that's the next is, one, man. That's yeah. what we're gonna do after LAFB. Here we that's go. That's right. Yeah. Well, we already have planned for LFB. We want we want to launch like our own like kind of documentary production for yes. LA football because there's so many untold stories. Um, so obviously we'll be involved in that. And I think you and I both have such a love for film and even documentary film. And you know, there's sure. so many great LA football athletes. So anyway, that's uh, but that will be coming soon, folks. So so be on the lookout for that. All right, let's do um. Trent Krim, the independent Jamal. I love Trent Krim's character. Um, again, I kind of went on a stretch on this comparison, but I think I had some fun with it. I'm really curious to see what you did because Krim's character is such a defining character, but such an interesting character that the real transition he makes through all three seasons. So who you got? Yeah, I think, you know, when I think of Krim, I still think of the journey, you know, and, and that's kind of been the the lens in which I've sort of compared these characters, not necessarily in some cases, you know, it's sort of a smack you know, hey, this person is this person today in this shape or form. And in other cases, it's it's the gradient. It's the journey of that they're going on. And for me, Trent was someone who was an outsider. He was a skeptic. He was someone who sort of challenged the way AFC Richmond was doing things um, and then kind of got an insider's view, uh, you know, that third season and then kind of slowly became one of them and became part of the community. And I think that the journey that, Trent Krim has completed is the journey that I think Gavin Newsom is on. I think Trent Krim is Gavin Newsom in, in terms of the, the okay. ethos of LA football, uh, because Gavin has been obviously such a detractor of this move to the big 10 for USC and UCLA in particular for UCLA and has sort of been this blocker with the Berkeley tax and all of these things much in the way Trent Krim was the first season, season and a half of this show uh, being kind of the outsider, not quite in, on the team, but adjacent to the team, uh, you know, Newsom being adjacent to L.A. football, but still very much a part of it, ironically enough, the last year and a half. And now as this these two teams go to the Big Ten and UCLA in particular, how he sees that evolution of UCLA football and what it will mean for the state of California in terms of you know, all the tourism that's going to come in, all of the things that are going to happen for SoCal football, for the Rose Bowl, for a public institution that is actually going to be of benefit. I, I really see a world where Gavin Newsom is actually going to become a huge proponent of, of UCLA football in a couple of years because, yeah, he's a politician and that's what they do. They waffle. And, yeah. and I think that the journey that Krim has completed, I think, is the journey that Newsom is on. And I can see much in the way Krim wrote a book about it, I don't think Newsom's not going to write a book about it, but I think there, there's going to be moments here where Newsom's going to be asked to sort of reflect on this experience in the years to come. And either through a press conference or through other forms of media, uh, I think he's going to be able to do that. And, and I can see a world where Newsom comes to a UCLA football game um, in a couple of years and, and is really sort of rooting them on. So, you know, it, it's a journey, but I, I, see, I see Gavin Newsom as, as Trent Grimm. Yeah, spot on. I mean, if I was playing... LA football bingo. I didn't expect Gavin Newsom to make the pot. Yeah. Thing, but, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I know. I totally get that journey and, and kind of where he was and we'll see if he gets to where Trent Krim got to be. Um, but certainly could be. And like you said, he's a politician. So I fully expect him to get there because he lost and now he knows uh, to, to stay afloat. He's going to have to flip sides and, and welcome the change with open arms. So um, for me, so this, I went, a deep level, but also very surface level, if that makes sense. So Trent Krim's character, everything you just said, um, I'll, I'll just reiterate basically that he kind of starts off on this journey of, you know, skeptic and then becomes a part of the, a part of the culture, if you will. And, and so for me, I saw that as, okay, you start at a 
I don't want to say lower level human, but just like a lower level. And you go on this journey to reach your full potential. And like the AC Richmond and Ted Lasso was able to unlock that with him. And kind of, he bought into that. And so for me, I see someone else from up North. I see our, our favorite lawyer, Jay Michael Sturdivant, <laughs> who went to Cal, you know, played at Cal, very good player, had a very good season last year in the PAC 12, but realized to meet his expectation, to meet his reality, it's going to have to come down south to UCLA. Transfer UCLA now in this culture, in this Bruins system, going to the Big Ten next year. He'll fully be able to realize who he is as a person, who he is as a player, and reach leaps and bounds. And Trent Krim, we saw, reaches as a character, but also in terms of success, writing this book that ends up becoming a very successful book. You know, he he was let go of the paper. And so he had no job and then ends up succeeding that. And we'll see J. Michael Sturdivant leave and transfer and end up succeeding what he did at Cal at UCLA. So, well, you know, I, I love that. I, I, I look forward to the Sturdivant journey and, and, you know, Ryan, I think there's, you know, from the perspective that you took, I think that there's a number of Trent Crims, you know, oh, yeah. I, I think you can see Sturdivant. I think Kyle Ford, I think Oladijo. I think there's all of these guys, Carson Steele, um, on, on the UCLA side, and then you go on on the other side with SC, and you look at Marshawn Lloyd and Dorian Singer and Jamil Muhammad and Mason Cobb, and so I, I think there's a lot of Trent Crims in terms of maybe you know Trent wanting Crims, to be. Maybe he's just the transfer portal. Maybe that's maybe he's just the transfer portal. I love it. You know, uh, TC is the TP. You know, yeah. so uh, it's I think it's it's guys who kind of want to reach their full potential, want to join you know one of these teams and one of these cultures that they really believe in. So. Uh, you know, I think that it's, you know, I, I think what's interesting is that not every character needs to be a person. Not every yeah. character needs to be a football player. Not every character, you know, a, a football, you know, a, a character can represent an institution. It can represent an ideal. It can represent, uh, you know, like we talked about a journey or, or you know, some sort of a dynamic. So I, I really like that in terms of kind of the angle. And, uh, you know, Krim was a huge piece of the team. I mean, let's not forget he was so... I think instrumental in Chris Hughes's, you know, comfort level with, you know, of, of wanting to come out, um, you know, uh, being, being a gay player on the team and, you know, him sharing his experience, um, you know, in, in season three. And I think, so he made a huge contribution there. And so let's hope the start of ants of the world and, and the Oladijos and the singers and the Lloyds make big contributions on their team this year, uh, because that's going to make LA football even more fun. Yeah. Yeah. That episode in Amsterdam was so great, but um, yeah, I mean, there's, I think if we're reading deep into it, there's a reason why Trent Krim left the independent and yeah, yeah, yeah. join a culture first, team first. And that's kind of what USC and UCLA are both feeling. The transfer portal has so much fog around individuality and oneself. Right. But there's another benefit to it is you join a different culture, a different team that you can become a family of. It's the one dynamic of kind of choosing your family, if you will. And the transfer portal's given these players the ability to go. And at SC, Lincoln Riley and UCLA, Chip Kelly have really laid the foundation of this family first, culture first team style and so i think these guys have found that so there's your your tc to tp friend crim yes sir all right this next one i'm not gonna lie i, I still am struggling with this one so i'm gonna listen to yours and, and i'll see where i can go with it but rupert is obviously a you know the the dark character of the show but such a necessary character in the show and and helps kind of move storylines forward in different ways but uh, yeah, who in LA football you got playing? Oh, to playing me, Rupert? this is this is the no. This was the easiest one of the eleven. Uh, you know, for Rupert, it's Mike Bone. You know, uh, so Rupert is Mike Bone, no question about it. To me, uh, in terms of, you know, we'll start with the obvious of you know just sort of the behavior and and the sort of the level of respect in the culture. I mean, Rupert was accused of of uh, you know harassment, and that's yeah. exactly what Mike Bone is accused of. And so you know that's pretty spot on. I think the culture that they both created, uh, you know, respectively, you know, with West Ham, um, you know, I think the the challenges that even Nate had, you know, Nate wanted to kind of create his own version of Diamond Dogs. And it just it wasn't going to happen because it was just a very combative culture. It was a very, you know, win at all costs type of culture. And by all indications, that's the culture that Mike Bone has created at USC Athletics. And that's why he needed to leave. But to your earlier point, Ryan, Rupert was also a very necessary piece 
to move storylines along and to move things along in terms of Rebecca's journey, in terms of Ted's journey, AFC Richmond and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, and Mike Bone was that as well. I mean, he was the athletic director at the time that Lincoln Riley was hired. He was the athletic director at the time USC chose to go to the Big Ten. So he was a necessary piece in terms of moving the, the machine along for other characters and other individuals and other institutions to be able to reach their potential. But as a as a flawed human being and as someone that, you know, in terms of what he represented, uh, both both on the pitch and, and, you know, in the boardroom and in terms of organizational culture, I don't think there is a more accurate, you know, mirroring of one another than Rupert Mannion and, and Mike Bone for what they were accused of, what they've been criticized of, the cultures that they've created. And even when you think about kind of the West Ham colors a little bit, felt a little SC-ish at times. Uh, over the years, given given the organizational culture, yeah. So I'm going to cop out and cheat because there there is no better answer. I mean, it, it is Mike Bone, and I'll just add to it though um, for my time. And and I think the the other comparison you can make is to the public eye. Rupert had it all. Yeah, to the public eye. Like he yes. he had his AFC Richmond team. He ended up leaving Rebecca, leaving that. Bought a new team in West Ham. Everyone when he was at pubs. He, drinks were on him. Everyone to be around him. It was he was a guy that had it all figured out. That reached the pinnacle of success in terms of club ownership, in terms of business savviness. And that was Mike Bone up until this. I mean, the public eye didn't know about what was going on at Cincinnati and his previous stops. The public eye thought everything at USC was all because of what we saw in the Big Ten move and in you know NIL stuff starting to grow and bringing in Lincoln Riley and all this, that everything was just absolutely going on without a hitch, even myself included. I mean, I was like, USC is fully back in terms of getting over these, these dumb, stupid, uh, you know, bad things going on. And little do we know behind the scenes, that was not the case. And that's the same thing with Rupert. Obviously, us as the viewer see behind the scenes all the time in the TV shows. Uh, we don't get to see that in real life, but now we're seeing it come to fold with Mike Bones. So yeah, there, I mean, there is no, no other answer for, for who plays Rupert. No, absolutely. Right. You, you said it best of, of, you know, behind the veil. And, and I think that, you know, in front of, in front of the veil, you know, there's a, there's a totally different picture that we had, which is why it was so shocking what we heard from Mike Bone in USC the last, you know, the, about a month or so ago. And, and that what was actually behind the veil was a completely different story. And and so I, I think it's sort of, at least in my case, it's kind of fitting that for me, Rebecca was Lincoln Riley, because to me, that dynamic of, of mm-hmm. kind of the Riley bone dynamic of, of Rebecca kind of overcoming uh, Rupert and just kind of being her own person um, and, and sort of defining success by her, her terms and what means you know what what it means to her i think is the same journey that lincoln riley's on now it's like look i, I got nothing to do with with mike bone i said what i had to say politically to just kind of get it out of the way but you know this is all on me now you know and, and lincoln riley is the most powerful person at usc i mean there is no athletic director there's no sense that there's going to be an athletic director at usc you know for the immediate future He's, he's not only the most powerful person in USC athletics, you know, he's the most powerful person on the football team. He was the most powerful person on the basketball team. He was the one who was there recruiting Bronny James, not Andy <laughs> Enfield. He's the most yeah. powerful guy in the university. I mean, Carol Fultz, one of her four moonshots for the university is for athletics to be back. I mean, what does that tell you yeah. Um, yeah, at the president of the university? So it, it's all on Lincoln Riley. He has carte blanche here. And so now he's going to define success the way he wants to and much the way Rebecca, you mm-hmm. know, gave 49% of the team to the people because she is defining success the way she wants to. She has total ownership. She has total authority. And so I think the, the, the Rupert, Mike Bone element is so spot on because even their partners to me, I think that dynamic is very similar as well. Yeah, I love it. That came full circle because, um, yeah, it's so, so spot on and, and so true and so well said. So um, well done, my friend. Um, all right, we got the final four here. Final four. Let's go uh, Nate the Great to start. Um, what a fascinating character throughout the show. A true heel turn, if you will, if you want to use that phrase. And then and then a kind of prodigal son returning in season three or late in season three. Um, but just such a interesting, well-written, well-acted character. Who you got playing Nate the Great? You know, uh, Ryan, for me, the, the story of Nate is one of 
you know, an un, untapped genius, right? I mean, sort of a, an overlooked genius who, you know, has so much there and then kind of gets the opportunity, gets the platform to shine and then kind of supercharges ahead of that platform and maybe gets ahead of himself as well. Like the, the pace of, you know, his career exploding got too fast and got too, too much out in front of him. He kind of lost sight of who he was a little bit and now finds himself back at Richmond at a place where now he's comfortable. He knows what he's capable of, but he also knows what he's not capable of. And now he can sort of really thrive in an environment where it it sort of meets all of his needs. And so there's sort of this arc. It's sort of this parabola. He starts as sort of an unknown, you know, and then he sort of explodes as the wonderkin and then, you know, now comes back down to earth, but hopefully set up for long-term success. And for me, in the ethos of L.A. football, it's Chip Kelly. And, and when you think about the genius, the untapped genius that Chip Kelly was at a place like New Hampshire and starting a new offense that sort of changed the game and the, the true kind of X's and O's genius, and then he gets on with Oregon and, and kind of gets the platform and races out in terms of revolutionizing the sport in much the way Nate kind of became the darling of the league and then kind of took that and supercharged it to the next level with the Niners, with the Eagles, but the success got too too far out in front of him. And, you know, he was no longer driving the train. The train was driving him, and he struggled. He struggled as a person. He didn't really know who he was. And, you know, there, there were moments with Nate where I think he wanted to be more empathetic but couldn't be and didn't know if that was really what the definition of success was or he could be empathetic and still be successful and sort of lost sight a little bit of who he really was and he was trying to play a role a little bit more. And I think that was kind of Chip's experience in the NFL, where the things that sort of worked for him to be this genius and this this guy, this innovator that was sort of recognized for changing the game, it's not working. And he didn't really know who he was. And now he comes back to UCLA the way Nate comes back to AFC Richmond. And he picked UCLA over the likes of a Florida because he realized he wants to be in an environment that's more than just about athletics. It's books and ball. It's in a place where it's not just this sort of the, the, the piranha of media that's going to sort of dissect his every move where he can sort of be secluded a little bit. He can be more than just a football coach and he can sort of be in an environment where he knows what worked back then. He also knows what didn't work. And now he can sort of thrive for success with that area under the curve. And I think that's what Nate is. He knew what didn't work, what worked. And now I think he's set up for success as Roy's you know, sort of top assistant with Beard and can really grow. And I think eventually, if there was sort of a spinoff, I see Nate eventually taking over for Roy as the head coach of AFC Richmond as he's sort of grown up. And so to me, that journey just feels so Chip Kelly. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. It's spot on and, uh, you know, broken down and just kind of, the as you said, the parabola of where his career went and now where he is. And and I truly believe, I think me and you both do, that, that Chip will – finish his career at UCLA. Absolutely. Uh, I think he'll, when it's said and done, he'll either retire as UCLA head coach or, or when his time comes in at UCLA, he won't coach elsewhere. So um, I think that's a, a perfect comparison of finding your home and coming back to it in a way. Um, and so for me, I went uh, similar in a sense of that parabola of a career, much shorter in a sense. Um, but I went with Cam Akers running back for the Rams. Wow. A guy that, a guy that you know, was drafted and so there's obviously some expectations but similar to like an unknown you know you're coming to the nfl as a rookie similar to how nate is all of a sudden you know the equipment manager and then ted kind of brings him up to like assistant coach the unknown and then you see those flashes in that rookie and second season of some brilliance that he had at florida state and like nate had the great you know all the the plays that he came up with and you see the wonderkin and the smarts there and then last year there's that super weird where Cam Akers is just off the team, just gone. Just like Nate leaves. Nate's gone. Obviously different reasons. Nate kind of reaches a different pinnacle of going and becoming a head coach somewhere. Whereas Cam Akers just kind of ends up in the, in the doghouse of Sean McVay or just decides that he thought he was worth more touches or thought he could do more somewhere else. Like Nate thought he could do more at West Ham or at another place because he wasn't, his, he wasn't letting his wings fly at uh, AFC Richmond and Cam Akers felt that he wasn't really letting himself fly with the Rams and, and then come to find out there's not, there wasn't a market out there to trade him. 
there wasn't a, a, a change that he could do on his own. So he needed to kind of come back and, and recenter himself and see that the Rams were his home. And I think the last comparison I'll make Jamal is when Nate comes home, and this is kind of to your point in the very beginning of the show, when we we're talking about Ted Lasso, I think there was a lot of expectation that there'd be kind of this, this grand coming back of Nate. Like he'd take over either as head coach or he'd get this big, huge scene with, with Ted of this makeup. And, and again, I'm not saying that it could have done that, but the way the show goes is it's very just like, all right, we forgive each other. Now let's get back to work. And I think that's kind of like what happened with Cam Akers is he may not be this star now because all of a sudden he's back in good graces, but he's back. He's running back for the Rams. He's going to play this year and it could be, you know, he's gone the next year. It could be, it happens again. But as far as what we know, ending with Ted Lasso is Nate's back. He's an assistant coach. Kind of he's back in good graces going into 2023. We know Cam's back. It's a crowded running back room. It's going to be an open competition, but he has a job. He has a roster spot. And what will he achieve uh, is kind of up to him and up to whether where he feels comfortable with. So those were kind of how I saw them kind of intertwining in a way. No, I love it, Ryan. And I think, you know, it's, it's with, with Nate, it's all about the journey and, you know, where he started, where he peaked, where he ended. And so I think it's it's that journey we can see in a lot of different players. And, you know, sometimes – the nature of pro football and pro sports today is, you know, you come on, you know, as, as gangbusters, there's so much hype and, you know, the media has a lot to do with this. We, we hype guys up and, you know, the expectations are through the roof. And then if those expectations are not met, even by a little bit, you know, those guys get torn down, ripped to shreds, and then they have to sort of figure out, can they handle that? And then, you know, rebuild and, or are they going to kind of go in a tailspin? And so, I think Nate's journey is in so many ways the journey of a top draft pick in in football, in basketball, where, you know, once you kind of get your shot, once you're noticed, once you're seen, you know, how do you handle that? You know, you can sort of be that that prospect or that recruit that's sort of flying under the radar that isn't really being paid attention to. But once you get your shot, you know, how do you handle it and what do you do with it? So Nate's another one where to me, he's he's chip all the way but he can also be representative of the process of, you know, becoming a star athlete and, and how to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's just an incredible journey and, and these athletes face this all the time and how they deal with that. And there's sometimes some low points, then how do you get back to that high point again? So, um, all right, quickly, Jamal, we haven't done this in a while, but for our, before we get to our last three, haven't mentioned our, our sponsor athletic greens or, or AG one in a while. So I feel like, now is a good time. Uh, I drink AG1, you know, in the morning. I usually do it right when I wake up before my coffee, and uh, it makes me feel great. You know, it's it's great for your gut health. It's got seventy five different nutrients all packed in. It's basically one scoop in a cup of water. Shake it up quick, chug it, you're done. Um, but it's just really really healthy for you. And it, it, as long as you make it kind of a part of your day, um, it's really going to help you have that extra umph you need throughout the day to just be healthier and, um, you know, feeling better. So if a comprehensive solution is what you need for your supplemental routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply. That's free. One-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is go to drinkag1.com slash L-A-F-B. That's drinkag1.com slash L-A-F-B. And check it out. You're not going to regret it. Um, it's a great product. I've started giving it to all my friends and family, and everyone loves it. So check it out. All right, Jamal. Final three here. Jamie Tart. Neither, I mean, we say it's about every character, but it's just like it's so well written, just how these characters ebbed and flowed throughout these seasons. And and Jamie's another one. It's just like so great. His um, how much he kind of changes and grows and matures, and like it's the true story of an athlete you get this young hot shot and then they become kind of just what we we're talking about with nate but this is like truly the athlete like the young hot shot they kind of reach the pinnacle they're they're all about themselves and then how do they come back to making it about them or about the team and helping the team get better so you got for jamie tart yeah ryan you know this is a this is an interesting one and you know for me i think you and i may be a little inverted between between you know our perspectives on jamie and let's say sam obisania i have a feeling let's see but uh, you know i i don't want to sort of spoil it and, and speak for you but to me tart in the journey that tart is on is the journey we're waiting for justin herbert to go on and so for me i saw jamie tart as justin herbert as 
the young guy, uber talented, but, you know, and, and not necessarily unlikable, but not, you know, someone that folks are going to sort of galvanize around and, and sort of be the leader of the team. And, you know, someone who just, you know, the, the, the individual talent jumps off the page with Tart, individual talent jumps off the page with, with, with Justin Herbert. But over the course of the show, and particularly in the season three, how Tart realizes there's more to this game and there's more to greatness than just me going out there and scoring goals. I want to be the center. I want to be the center of total football. I want to be the, the guy that we sort of play through. And he becomes kind of this great assist man. You know, we don't see Jamie scoring goals at the end of the show the way we did at the beginning, but everything goes through him. He's sort of the lifeblood of the whole offense. And he's the one who realizes it. It's like, no, you, you don't have to play to me. You got to play through me. And I think we're waiting for that light bulb moment with Justin Herbert, where it's not about the 5,000 passing yards. It's not about the 40 touchdowns. How does this team play through Justin Herbert, both on and off the field and in the locker room? And how does he sort of channel their energies and, you know, get the greatest product out on the field and truly make the Chargers a contender? And I think the moment Ted sort of comes up with a new total football, which is sort of an ode to the last dance and an ode to the triangle offense, which I love so much, and kind of turn that. And the moment that is now in place, Jamie Tart becomes the head of the snake and discovers that. And that's when it all turns around for AFC Richmond and they go on you know, the 17 game win streak and become the best version of themselves. And I think that's what we're waiting for with the Chargers, because you can see the pieces much like AFC Mm -hmm. Richmond. You know, they had Sam, they had Rojas, they had the goalie, they had the captain. They have all of these guys that actually are quite good players. Hughes is very good, you know, but how do you kind of find that connective tissue, that glue, that leader to put it all together? And how does that the most talented player translate and grow and evolve to the greatest leader of the team and the greatest player on the team. And that's what we're waiting for for Justin Herbert. So it's a to-be-continued. It's a TBC. Mm-hmm. It's not an exact comparison right now. But for me, when I think of just, you know Justin Herbert, I think of the journey that Jamie Tart is on. And hopefully for the sake of LA football and the sake of the Chargers, that becomes a, a mirror image of one another. Yeah, and when looking just purely at, at playing the field to even expand, is you could look at you know the last – two seasons with with Joe Lombardi and you know statistically Herbert still had great years but they were very empty stats and and yeah. so Jamie Tart statistically is one of the best players you know in the in the Premier League but you know the team wasn't winning or they were empty exactly. or, and uh and so this year now with Kellen Moore with a, a total football or a total football scheme, exactly maybe the maybe the stats are maybe down even but they won't be empty stats. Every stat will be have a purpose and it'll hold someone else accountable to do something special with this team. Um, so yeah, I love that. I think that's great. Um, I went to a similar um, instance, but I, I was a little more, I guess, poignant in a sense that I, I chose based solely kind of on the transition from season two into season three. And I kind of saw that where we sit now, whereas Tart, you know, left AFC, goes to play for I think Chelsea if I'm not mistaken and then yeah, Man he's, City I mean, yep Man City excuse me Man City um and then when he comes back it's like that dynamic of like are you going to be accepted back is he welcome does the team want him you know Ted knew his greatness that was that was worth him being there but it was the team going to sign off on it Sam had that great scene of like I don't want him back this is how he treated me and so I kind of see Austin Eckler in a way mm. a guy that has always been kind of a team guy so that's a little different than Jamie but all of a sudden, this offset became a very me guy. And, you know, this is obviously a different scenario. This is football and running backs of a short shell life. So I don't want to talk like I'm talking down or bad on Austin Eckler. But just the stat, the, the facts are, was kind of looking out for himself. Here's the numbers I've put up. Here's where I rank within running backs. Here's where my salary ranks within running backs. Very kind of me. I want to be traded. Let me look what else is out there and see where I can go. Well, the the grass wasn't greener on the other side. He didn't actually leave like Jamie Tart, but the, the thought and the process and the, the searching was out there. Well, now he's back for at least one more year. And how is the team going to fully accept him? I mean, I think they will, but that's kind of the, the play I'm getting at is, is he going to be seen as a team player? Is he going to be seen as a future cog in this Kellen Moore system? Because the talent is there and the ability is there to run the system very well, but he may not be the centerpiece of it anymore. 
He's going to be sharing the load with other running backs. The ball is going to go through him, not to him, as much as it did in the Joe Lombardi system. So I see it kind of like that as a guy that somewhat theoretically left. Now he's back. How will the team accept him? How will he appreciate his new role in this new system? And will it elevate his game to a sense of maybe not statistically, but to a sense of, okay, it's working. We're winning. I'm here to stay. I'm a charger for life. Yeah, no, Ryan, I love that. You know, that's that that may be my favorite sort of analogy of yours to this point. And what's so interesting is that, you know, I think the leaving and coming back dynamic really sort of hits it home for me. And what's interesting is that Jamie went from a me guy to a we guy. He was a me guy. He left. He comes back as a we guy. Eckler right now, fairly or unfairly, was a we guy sort of mm-hmm. left this offseason, and he's come back as a me guy. And yep. so, you know, that that transition to go from we to me and vice versa, you know, is going to be really interesting to see how the team adopts him. And I think that how will he be able to sort of handle the role? What's interesting is that Jamie wanted it. He saw it and said, you got to play through me. You know, is Eckler going to sort of be in that play as a decoy and sort of play through guy? Is that really going to come from Eckler or is that going to be imposed upon him because Kellen Moore is going to say this is the better way for us to win and Eckler is going to be sort of a friction against that because he wants to get paid and he wants to have sort of long-term, you know, financial security. So really interesting nuance there about the Eckler dynamic. And I think the the one thing that's really a parallel is Eckler is the one guy who could wreck this whole season for the Chargers. Like if yeah. Eckler isn't right mentally and aligned with what needs to be done and he hasn't kind of come to peace with his offseason and his age and his position and where that sits in the market Eckler's a guy who could kind of wreck the chemistry and especially when Herbert is still young and we're still looking for Herbert to have that sort of Jamie Tart like evolution to be the leader and he's not quite there yet can Eckler kind of be actually in many ways the saboteur of the Chargers this year. You know, if, if Eckler was maybe, uh, I'm sorry, if Herbert was 28, 29, 30 years old and the already established leader of the team, you wouldn't be worried about it. You know, if, yeah. if Eckler is going into a Tom Brady, Peyton Manning type of situation, you'd be like, look, he, those guys are going to keep him in check. I'm not worried about it. But Herbert being kind of the the first season version of Jamie Tart to a certain extent, is that going to be enough? Is, are they going to have enough leadership in that locker room to be able to overcome that? Or is Eckler going to have to get benched and will that create a distraction? Or, you know, how is that really going to play out? So I think the, 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 the Herbert Eckler dynamic, you know, it's a little, each one of them is actually a little bit of Jamie Tart and how it all sort of shakes out is I think going to define the charges in 2023. And I think that's, what's going to be so exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So love, love both those. I think they make a ton of sense. So, all right, final two here, arguably my favorite character of the show, uh, Roy Kent, the actor was one of the writers of the show and kind of ended up auditioning himself for Roy Kent after writing the character, feeling that it it was him obviously got it and crushed it. Also went on to write one of my other favorite shows shrinking. If you haven't watched shrinking on Apple plus yet with Harrison Ford and Jason Siegel, fantastic. He wrote that show. He tells a story about how he got Harrison Ford to do the role, uh, which is quite fascinating and quite funny. Um, but who you got playing Roy Kent? I kind of struggled with this one, Jamal a little bit. And then I think I got to a good spot with it, but who you got? Yeah. Ryan, for me, it was, you know, again, with Roy, it was, you know, his personal evolution, right? You know, he, he did, he did one or two things really well in his life. He was a great soccer player and he was very intense and that worked for him to a certain part in his life up until the end of his soccer career. And then that next step, that next stage in life for him, both personally as well as professionally required growth. He needed to be sort of in a more evolved, a more multifaceted version of himself. And you sort of saw that he started opening up more. He was, more willing to have relationships, more willing, you know, he wanted to be a diamond dog by the end of it. He wanted to sort of, it had to be at his own pace and his own time, but he, had, he, he recognized the need to have to grow from someone who just did one or two things really well. And those one or two things came easy to him at an early part in his life to needing to do seven or eight or nine things well even though those other things may not come that easy in order for him to be really fulfilled, both personally as well as professionally. 
And when I see the the context of LA football from that lens, I think of Brandon Staley because Brandon Staley to me is a guy who has come up and has done a couple of things really well. He was a great defensive coordinator and he's gutsy. And, you know, those are the two things he's been able to sort of hang his hat on up until a certain point in his career. But for Brandon Staley to truly become, I think, a long-term successful coach in the NFL, he is going to have to grow in other ways, in other dimensions, in terms of, you know, sort of offensive variety, in terms of people, in terms of relationship management, in terms of pipeline with the coaches, in terms of strategic judgment in game, in terms of calm, you know, all of these other elements now with Brandon Staley need to evolve for him to ultimately be the long-term coach of the Los Angeles Chargers for a team that hopefully will be contending for a Super Bowl for the better part of a decade. And I think it's ironic that Roy ends up being the coach of AFC Richmond because Rebecca saw the growth that he was trying to make. I mean, from, you know, even taking the press and that, that the answer that he gave, you know, with, with regards to kind of the incident the team had with the fan and how Roy was able to kind of step into that role and do it very much the way Roy would on his terms with his style, but he grew. And Rebecca saw that journey and made him the long-term coach. And I think we're looking similar to kind of the Herbert journey. There's a journey that Staley now is sort of embarking on and needs to really execute on this year for him to be that long-term coach of the Mm -hmm. Chargers. And I think it's also sort of symbolic that, that baby blue that Roy was wearing in the last scene as the coach is, is, is yeah. sort of the Chargers powder blue. And so to me, Roy and Staley kind of go hand in hand in terms of their evolution. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, I think that's, that's probably the, the best one. I actually, I went back and forth a lot uh, with this one. And the player I chose, I'll say after I went with the kind of the same direction you went with the growth. It's kind of where I went, but I started off the easy one to me was Matthew Stafford. Cause it's like, here's a guy that was peak of the game. First overall pick was kind of the face, maybe never the face of the league. Like Roy Kent wasn't necessarily the face, but definitely one of the, the star faces. And now going into this year, I mean, think of everyone's talking about Matthew Stafford. Like, is he too hurt? Is he ever going to play again? Like, is he, is he washed? Is he done? That was all the talk of Roy Kent in kind of season one is like, is he actually, good anymore or is he is he too old to play is he too injury prone and so that was kind of the easy one but i ended up going with kind of the the evolution like you did of this this needing to grow from good slash great to like goat status if you will and i went with caleb williams Mm. and i went with him because here's a guy that everyone is singing the praises to right now it is hard to find anyone criticizing caleb williams which Rightfully so. I mean, the kid's been unbelievable. He's he's great off the field. He's charismatic. Um, you can say everything good about him, which is true. So I'm not sitting here to – I'm not going to start turning the guy down. But there are aspects in his game that in order to live up to those comparisons of Patrick Mahomes, right, wrong, and different, there are little things that we've talked about that are going to need to improve. Maybe a little bit of pocket presence, maybe a little bit of the deep ball touch, some, some little nuances here that do need to be improved upon in order to truly reach the next level of greatness. I think he's going to be good no matter what. He's already there. He's already a great, great college quarterback, and I think he could end today and still be a good NFL quarterback. But to be great, to reach that next level, like Roy Kent maybe didn't reach in his playing career, but as – uh, in life, he kind of reached that elevated because he was able to adapt and change and and mold his his self awareness that he didn't used to have. That's where we could see Caleb again. Just talking football for Caleb is these little different nuances that he can improve upon in order to take himself to even another level. So similar in, in regards to the the growth that is needed, um, and I think that the that's where we see those two characters kind of melt. You know, I, I love that Ryan, and I think what's so interesting, and you and I have sort of talked about it. Look. Caleb Williams is the face of college football. Caleb Williams is the greatest prospect at the quarterback position since Andrew Luck. I mean, you know, you're talking about a once in a decade type of player. And so now the question is, what's the fire under the belly with Caleb? And how much is he willing to put the work in for that final 5%, 3%, 1% the way Roy Kent was willing to put in the work for his life? And you know, with Caleb, so much of it is, you know, the Pareto rule, right? The Pareto rule is is essentially saying that, look, in 
20% of the effort, you can get 80% of the results, right? But it's that last 20% of results requires 80% of the effort. But I think Caleb is an even more extreme version of the Pareto yeah. principle where he's at the, it's like 95.5. I think like 95% of Caleb's effort now this year moving forward is going to have to go into that final 5% of performance. Mm-hmm. You and I talked about downfield accuracy. You and I talked about, you know, making sure that he's decisive in the pocket and isn't kind of turning it into a Sandlot street game and getting into some bad habits. So how much he's willing to kind of, I think, take on the mindset of Roy Kent to sort of improve going into 23, I think is going to be the dominant storyline for USC because honestly, nothing Caleb Williams will do this year is going to change his position as the number one pick in the draft. And I think that's kind of a scary place if you're sort of a Trojan fan because you're kind of like, hmm, you know, we expect the playoff now finally for the first time in 15 years. Is this the year since that Sanchez year in 08 where USC is really, really back? We were close last year, yeah. but couldn't quite get to the, to the finish line in terms of having just a, a really great season. You know, Caleb could chill this year. SC goes nine and three. He's still the number one pick in the draft. And, yeah. and that's, that's sort of the scary place is how much is he willing to sort of put in that attention to detail and that time to put together really an incredible season despite having won the Heisman, despite being kind of the unanimous number one pick and really going into it. So it's going to be Caleb's fire under the belly and his willingness to go for that extra step, that extra percent, 3%, 5%, that's going to be the defining moment and the defining narrative for USC in 23. Yeah, hundred percent. It's gonna be so fun to watch. Cannot wait to be at the Collie and and at USC to watch it all go down. So, well, here we are, the final chapter of the LA Football Show. Here, we didn't plan to go an hour and a half on this, Jamal, but uh, here we're here's where we are. We, yes, uh, sir. We pulled it the whole limit. So, thank you all for hanging out with us. Hopefully, it's been fun. Let us know your thoughts. You can text LAFB to three one zero three two or L- at LAFB Jams or at Brian Dybrud LAFB on Twitter or both of us or at LAFB Network. Make sure to like and subscribe wherever you are listening. Um, and if you're on radio, go like and subscribe and go to LAFBnetwork.com. Final one, Jamal. Coach Ted Lasso. We know they're different because uh, the one I have, you've already said. So I'm glad we didn't have the same. We didn't have the same on any of them, surprisingly. The last few lists we've done, we have had very different yeah. um, outcomes. So who's playing Coach Lasso? To me, there was one person um, in, in the ethos of L.A. football that, you know, epitomized Ted Lasso more than any other person by, by leaps and bounds for me. Because when you think about Ted Lasso, you think of you think about kind of the epitome of leadership and the epitome of building a culture. And, you know, there were pieces there with AFC Richmond, disparate pieces, right? A, a washed up Roy Kent and up and coming Jamie Tart. There were, there were pieces there, but it took someone with a fresh energy, with empathy, with care to really build a culture that everybody wants to be attached to. And someone who is a man of the people and someone who... You know, I think of Ted Lasso even on his way to practice, walking down the streets and saying hi to everyone and everyone knows who he is and he's got sort of the time for everyone. And to me, the, the, the individual that has created culture in a way that nobody has in, in L.A. football since I can remember having been born and raised in, in L.A. and it's still to, to be continued and more to be done is Martin Jarman. And Martin Jarman to me is Ted Lasso. And, and, you know, through and through. And when you look at, you know, what believe means to Ted Lasso and what that sign was and when what elite means to Martin Jarman. And when you look at Martin on social media and with the crowd and dancing with fans, I mean, and that's Ted, you know, through and through and just building this culture, one relationship at a time with a, an upstart team, a team that has sort of had a history of, of underachieving, being mediocre, losing much in the way USC athletics and particularly football has been the last 20 years and coming in and being this breath of fresh air from a totally different perspective and being young and vibrant and Ted coming from a different world, uh, from a different sport and sort of infusing this life and sort of building this culture one at a time, one relationship at a time where it becomes this such a powerful galvanizing thing that everybody wants to be a part of and be uh, you know, sort of magnetized towards. And when you think about what Martin Jarman has done with the relationship with Chip Kelly and bringing in 
letting Deshaun Foster grow and letting Jerry Neuheisel grow and letting Ken Norton Jr. grow and DeAnton Lynn grow and all of the things that he's done for the Big Ten and everything that he's had to go through in terms of criticism from the Gavin Newsoms, from, you know, the state of California, from the legislature, in, in much the way Ted has had to kind of go up against the press and, and, and sort of the, the environment around him and get the fans on board and get everyone on board. To me, you know, Martin Jarman is the epitome of leadership in L.A. football. And so it was a, it was a no brainer for me that Martin Jarman is Ted Lasso. Yeah, it's pretty spot on. I didn't think uh, very similar our results. You'll see here in a second, but I didn't quite think high level enough. So uh, but yeah, Martin Jarman is like the modern day Ted Lasso in a sense. So um, the way I went was very similar in you, um, but I think a guy that. At the time, I wouldn't say was a was a head scratch hire, but was kind of like a hmm, okay because of you know it was like past success, but then some failure, and then uh, a guy that has maybe different ideologies or different ways of building a program and building a culture. Culture, and you know I went with Chip Kelly, um, so just the man underneath Martin Jarman. But I think um, character wise or personality wise, very different than Ted Lasso, but in terms of importance of culture and integrity and the human element very similar and i think he's got a lot of criticism for that through his tenure um i think the other comparison of of starting slow and now we're just seeing the results you know ted lasso they didn't win obviously right off the bat he was he didn't know soccer he didn't know what he was doing in terms of like what to do on the pitch but he was building something behind the scenes that was going to pay dividends later on and with Chip, we saw year after year, like one more win, one more win. And then finally we saw nine wins. And now maybe we'll see that 10, 11, 12 wins. And so it was kind of a slow build. But when you put integrity and character at the forefront and leading young men to become better leaders and better men, and then you cycle in actual football and X's O in that, I think that's something very powerful. And that's what Ted Lasso proved. And I think that's what Chip Kelly's proving. And me and you have always been in his corner because we see the vision. We see what the building blocks are being put down in order to get to the precipice of where they want to be. And hopefully now this 2023 20, season or the first season in the big 12, we will see that come to fruition, see them win the premier league or see them win the pac 12 for the last time or the big 10. So, um, Martin Jarman is probably the perfect answer, but I think Chip Kelly has a very similar um, coincidence there with uh, with what Ted Lasso is. No, for sure, Ryan, and I I love that. And and you know, so some of the parallels, some fun parallels, obviously, is you know, books and ball being kind of the ethos of of Chip and how much actually you know reading played a role in Ted Lasso as well. You know, when you saw the assistant coaches, there were always there was always books, there was always yeah. kind of different um, references to things outside of the sport you know what I also love about the parallel to UCLA is what was the frame in Ted Lasso's office it was the pyramid of success you know Mm -hmm. birth at UCLA and you know those values and Chip talks so much about the pyramid of success as really being you know the the thing that he leans on in terms of the lineage to coach Wooden and that was the element that Ted Lasso leaned on so much and Rebecca even made a point about the frame in, in the last episode if you recall uh, of it sitting there. And so to me, the other kind of interesting nuance is, you know, a book was written about Ted Lasso and books have been written about Chip Kelly. And, you know, so a uh, very similar there, but, you know, leading with empathy, leading with integrity, I think it's first and foremost. And I think it, it speaks to that you and I talked, of, you know, thought of the same organization. We thought of the same team and we thought about kind of the same chain of command. I was just, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Chip Kelly's boss and you're talking about Chip Kelly. Um, so it makes perfect sense there that culturally we sort of see it this way. And it it's a, a work in progress still. And as is AFC Richmond, AFC Richmond didn't win the whole shebang, you know, mm-hmm. at the end. And they're still striving uh, for the pinnacle. And I think one of the fans said it best, you know, in the last episode, you know, one of the three fans were always at the bar and he said, you know, in a weird way, if we win today and we win the Premier League, what is there left to strive for? I've got this like existential crisis. And, you know, the lady at the bar says, well, you know, have a family and have kids. And he's like, that's boring. You know, like what else (laughs) is there to strive for? And so I think it was beautiful that AFC Richmond didn't win the Premier League because there's more to do. And obviously there's more to do with UCLA football. And, you know, there was a recent article, Ryan, uh, I think it was Sports Illustrated that said that, hey, we, we, we can sort of see a world where UCLA kind of has the success that Stanford had, you know, over the last, you know, seven, eight, ten years of 
you know, it's not USC, it's not the Big Ten, but how they can sort of incorporate the academics and the social into success on the field the way Stanford did. So I think people can start seeing it, that there is a path here um, to, to greatness and, and doing it their way with the integrity top of mind. And so to me, Jarman, Chip, you know, all of UCLA kind of speaks to Ted Lasso. I mean, couldn't, I mean, you talked about the four principles with Ted Lasso and, you know, the fourth one revealed itself with believe and, you know, the sign and everyone holding a piece of the sign. And I, I go back to what Chip says, you know, it's four legs of a chair. Those are his four principles, you know, academic, athletic, spiritual, and social, you know, the parallels are, are pretty significant to me. He feels very Martin Jarman because of personality, but you can make the argument either way with, with Chip as well in terms of values. So we got there. There we go. We got there. There you have it. The LA football Ted Lasso extravaganza. Let us know how we did. Hit us up. Ryan Dyer LAFB, LAFB Jams. Text LAFB to 31032. Thank you all. Thank you, Jamal. That was a lot of fun. Hour and a half. Thank you all on radio for hanging out with us. Make sure to go like and subscribe on a podcast or YouTube or LAFBnetwork.com. Everyone have a fantastic weekend. We'll be back next week. Be well. Be safe. This is the LA Football Show. Talk to you all soon. Thank you.